There's nothing like the feeling of being accepted, is there? Being accepted is, is absolutely awesome. I remember the day back in 2005, nervously waiting for my dial-up internet to connect with that noise it makes, and finally it connected and I found out that I had been accepted into a degree at university. And I remember then getting the follow-up letter in the post and holding it in my hand. You have been offered a place. And it's such a good feeling because it was, it was like almost there's something secure about your future holding that acceptance letter in your hand. But just a few weeks after being accepted, there was something you know, that I hadn't quite taken into account, just a minor detail, that you actually have to go to university. You actually have to go to class. You have to buy the books. You have to sit in the lessons. And so just a few weeks after all the joy of being accepted, I was there in class being stretched with learnings that I'd never learnt before. And I was staying up late finishing assignments and I was spending money on books and I was facing the prospect of sitting tests and exams and graduation day felt a very, very long way away. And this is the new scenario for the people of Israel in Exodus. They've been brought through, they've been accepted, they've been delivered through the Red Sea. Praise God! And, and we see that at the Red Sea, they praise God because the horse and the rider, their enemy, have been drowned in the sea. But on the other side of the sea, with the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore, we see that there isn't a straight line to the promised land. God isn't finished with them. Now they're enrolled in God's university. He has some things for them to learn, to grow, to change in, and it's the venue for it is the dry and dusty plains of the wilderness. God is going to teach them how to trust Him. And so this morning, we are going to start part two of our Exodus series. In part one, we saw that God is the God who makes Himself known. At the beginning of Exodus, it seems like God is silent. The people are suffering and God is silent. But God powerfully makes Himself known. And He does it by delivering them ultimately through the Red Sea. But on the other side of the Red Sea, we see God teach them some lessons. And so we're going to start part two of Exodus, Lessons in the Wilderness. Because the lessons that they learned back then are still applicable for us today. God wants us to learn the same lessons. And we actually see that explicitly in the New Testament referring to these events. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, Paul says, Now these things happened to them, to the Israelites, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction for on whom the end of the ages has come. And so the connection between them then and us now is really easy for us to see. You see, in salvation, we are accepted by God through Jesus Christ. There's no going back from that. It cannot be revoked. We have been brought through the Red Sea by the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've been delivered from our slavery to sin. But God doesn't take us straight to heaven in glory. He actually works on us. He seeks to refine our character, to change us. You remember in the very first overview week of Exodus, I said that God has brought the people out of slavery, but now slavery has to come out of the people. They have to actually stop thinking and living like slaves and start living like the free children of God that they are. And, and, this is, and God actually does that through His university in, of the Christian life. Our training ground is life. It's the ups, the downs, the trials, the triumphs, the families, the relationships, the marriages, the careers. That's the training ground. That's God's university for helping us to live as the people of God until that graduation day where we stand with Him in glory. And so as we begin our, our new series, part two, Lessons in the Wilderness, let me just pray that God will really speak to us over the next seven weeks as we look at these wilderness wanderings. Lord, I thank you that we are accepted in Jesus Christ, that we have been brought through, that we have been delivered from our slavery to sin, that, Lord, your salvation cannot be revoked. Lord, we have seen your commitment to Israel in bringing them through and we rejoice 
that you have brought us through in Christ. And now I pray, Lord, that over the next seven weeks, we would open up our lives to you to be refined. Lord, your grace, your saving grace saves us, but your grace is also transforming. You don't just leave us where we are as slaves. You seek to refine us and change us until we graduate and stand with you in glory and you complete the work that you started in us. And so, Lord, I pray that we might open our lives up to you, that we might say to you over these next few months, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And I pray and ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our bodies need water. In fact, it's crucial for you to have water. Water serves as this important thing that actually balances our internal temperature. It keeps our cells alive. And without water, dehydration actually comes quite quickly. Extreme thirst comes, and then fatigue sets in, and organ failure, and ultimately death, a horrible death. And it's amazing how quickly that happens. As a general rule, you can only survive about three days without water. And so, little survival tip for you, if you're out in the wilderness and you're very hungry, don't first look for food. You can last longer without food. You need to find a supply of fresh water and stay there because after three days, you're going to be struggling to survive. And this is Israel's first problem. They have no water. It's only been three days since the Red Sea crossing and Moses leads them into the wilderness of Shur. And they probably carried all the fresh water that they could. Remember, there's two million people here, men, women, children, and also all of their livestock, which need water too. But three days in, and their water is running out, and they haven't found a fresh water supply. And so, make no mistake, this is drink or die. This is a drink or die situation. And so you imagine the mums and dads are looking at their children suffering in extreme thirst, and they're rationing out whatever water they have left to help them with their dehydration. But then just as dehydration starts to set in, praise God, they see an oasis up ahead. And finally, they are filled with hope. The kids, imagine they run ahead and the parents are filled with, with happiness. Even the sheep and goats are pretty happy. And when they get there, they bend down and they scoop up the water in their hands to have a drink and they have to spit it straight back out because this water is brackish. It's either filled with salt or even some kind of poison. And so it wasn't fit for human consumption. And so their oasis turned out to be a mirage and they named the place Mara, which in Hebrew means bitter. You see, the problem at Mara is that the people are dying of thirst and yet the water is bitter. But there's actually a greater problem here that you see at Mara, and it's more than bitter water. You see, remember, this is a people that had every reason to believe that God was good and that God was going to provide for them. They had cried out to God before, and God heard them, and he had responded to them. They saw that God controlled the water supply. He even turned the Nile River into blood. They, they saw that just a few days earlier, God had parted the water of the Red Sea for them to walk through. Not only that, but God had been present with them in the cloud. In fact, the cloud had actually led them to this place at Mara. And so God, even in his power and his control over creation, he could have rained down on them from the cloud to quench their thirst. They had every reason to believe that God would pro provide for them. And yet they do not ask him. They do not ask him. Instead, at the first sign of difficulty, they grumble and complain against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now, to be sure, it wasn't wrong for them to bring their problem to Moses. It's not wrong for you to bring your problem to a leader. It's not wrong for you to bring your problem to God. And we often talk about that here, that we shouldn't just, you know, grin and bear it but we should actually, like the psalmist do, we should come to God and we should share the nature and the extent of our problems and we have a whole Bible full of examples of people bringing their problems to God. The problem wasn't that they brought their problem to God. What was wrong was their attitude behind it. Their attitude was what was wrong. You see, 
The big problem at Mara is not bitter water. The biggest problem, or the bigger problem at Mara, is the bitterness of their hearts. The bitterness of their hearts. Now, built into this word grumbling, the grumbling and mumbling and murmuring and complaining in Hebrew carries the words of worry, of fret, of complaining, of self-importance, of narrow thinking, and of a lack of trust. You think about this every time that we are tempted to grumble or we give in to grumbling, those things are present. There's some worry, there's some fret, there's some lack of trust, there is some very narrow thinking, there's also a lot of self-importance and a lot of instant gratification that is required in those moments of grumbling. And rather than just try and, you know, go through this passage this week and think about how I could challenge you about it, I decided to go through and I realised as I started to journal through what are the main things that I complain about and man, I realised I complain a lot. I complain about a lot of things. I grumble about a lot of things and I wrote some of those things down like I, I grumble about raising my kids. I grumble about that and I complain about that and I complain about how little time I have for myself and how their behaviour often annoys me and I grumble about other people when other people don't see things the way I do or they oppose me or something like that, I don't always say it out front because we know how to control and make sure that we look okay on the outside, but inside, inside we grumble and we murmur and we complain and we feel hard done by, by other people. I grumble about what I don't have materially, what I don't have financially, and yet, man, God has blessed me so much beyond what I ever thought that I would, would have or be able to provide. And God has blessed me so much and yet I often find myself grumbling and complaining. I grumble and complain about how tired I am. I'm sorry guys if I've done that to you. I I do, I grumble and complain and I self-pity about how tired I am. Not that it's not an issue at times, but the grumbling and the attitude behind it. And that I don't deserve this and I deserve better, I deserve more. You know, to my shame, I grumble about my ministry. I grumble about the calling of God on my life. I don't want to have to go through difficult things. I don't want to have to bear weight. I don't want to deal with stress. I don't want other people to depend on me. I just want to go and disappear. I want to go and start a lawn mowing business and mow lawns, you know? (laughs) Do you feel me? Do you know what I mean? And I grumble and complain about these different things. I realise I complain a lot. You know, what's so bad about it? What's so bad about complaining? It's not that bad. You know, it is Australia's national sport. We, we kind of whine and we complain and we, you know, we love it. But in context here, we do see that a grumbling spirit is, is really wrong. You know, a grumbling spirit is a bad sin. A- and th- we see it here in the text because just three days earlier, God had proved his goodness to them by delivering them through the Red Sea. This was an amazing act of God's grace on people who did not deserve it. A complaining spirit is wrong, it's a bad sin because it's not in keeping with the amazing grace of our salvation. You know, we as people deserve by our sin eternal punishment in hell and yet God through his grace and mercy toward us has withheld his wrath for us, poured it out on Jesus that we might not suffer eternally. And so when we grumble about the small things in life, we have the bad attitude towards God and other people and we whinge and we complain and whine about that, it's not in keeping with what God has done for us. Lamentations 3.39 says, Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways. Let us return to the Lord. Let us return to the Lord. C.S. Lewis writes that the mood of hell is grumbling. The mood of hell is constant complaint, always having a gripe, never being satisfied, always thirsty for more and discontented. And so it really has no rightful place in the life of a Christian. It's actually a mark of spiritual immaturity to have a constant soundtrack of complaint coming from your life. It's not a mark of maturity, it's a mark of spiritual infancy. It's like when your kids whine and complain and it's unnecessary and it's ongoing, that's what it's like spiritually. It's a mark of spiritual immaturity. And the impact of it can be pretty destructive Grumbling has a power, but it's not a good power, it's a destructive power. 
And we see this in our relationship with God. It actually poisons your communion with God. If you think about it in, in your relationship or friendship or a marriage, if you have a relationship where one is complaining or both is complaining, it actually spoils the intimacy. It spoils the communion that, that you have. It keeps people apart. There's not a sense of closeness and bonding. And this is what can happen. If you constantly complain about life, about God, about other people, you will find that it will actually poison your intimacy with God. Could it be that because there's a constant narrative and soundtrack of complaint in your life that you are not experiencing the fullness of your relationship with God? And so it, it can poison that. It can also poison the community of God's people. In Hebrews 12, it says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Complaining is contagious. Grumbling is contagious. It spreads through a family and everyone starts complaining. It spreads through a workplace. You know, everyone starts complaining and, and, and it's this negativity. It, it spreads through a church. And you can actually really hinder somebody else's spiritual growth because you're always sowing a negative spirit, a complaining spirit. Well, thirdly, it poisons our witness to the world. Because, you know, if the soundtrack of our life is always grumbling and complaining, well, when does the good news cut through? When does, the, when does it sound like good news to people if we only ever are people who are filled with complaints? So think about that on the playground. Think about that in the workplace. Think about that in the cafe when you're meeting with people and different people. What do people get from you? Do they get a grumbling spirit or do they get something that's reinterpreting circumstances in a miraculous and powerful and different way? that actually speaks the good news of what God has done in your life. And so grumbling has a power to it, but it's a destructive power. Well, why do we do it? Why do we grumble? Why do we complain? Well, Psalm 106, verse 7, uh, the psalmist actually speaks to this account and says that they did not remember your many kindnesses and they rebelled against you by the sea. See, this is why we often find ourselves in that place of complaint and grumbling is because we have forgotten God's many kindnesses. We've forgotten His grace and His faithfulness in providing everything that they had needed. And so complaining and grumbling is actually an act of rebellion that doubts whether God truly is good and faithful and is kind and He delivers on His prom promises. And so the water is bitter, but the bigger problem here is the bitterness of heart. And probably the greatest foolishness about grumbling and complaining in our circumstances is actually thinking that it will make us feel better and also that it will accomplish something. Isn't that true? We have that urge to complain and we think that by complaining we'll feel better, but actually we don't feel better, we feel worse. And also it doesn't accomplish anything. Now I will say this, if you're on the phone to your bank, it is actually good to jump up and down and scream sometimes. Sometimes you can get something done the, by the, the, how loud you kick and scream. But in the Christian life, you may get your way in the short term through grumbling and complaining, but we create a bigger problem because our heart becomes hard, it becomes bitter, we rely on ourselves more and we rely on God less. And so there is a real power in grumbling, but it's only a destructive power. You see, there is a greater power at Mara, and it's not in the grumbling. In verse 24, we see that God accomplishes more through Moses' single prayer of faith than all the people's grumbling put together. God hears Moses' prayer of faith, where he comes before God, God's servant, and God hears the prayer of faith and he instructs him to take a log and throw it into this bitter stream. And a miracle happens. The water, the body of water that is bitter, all of a sudden becomes sweet. And the people drink and it quenches their thirst. And here we see the reason why when we come up against the bitterness of life, that we need to respond to God with faith, that we need to go to God in prayer with faith because He is the one who has the power to make what is bitter sweet. He is the one and He alone is the one. We can't do anything through our grumbling but through the prayer of faith, God can make what is bitter sweet. 
God can actually change our circumstances. He can, he can work to bring what is bitter and make it good. And so we must silence our complaints and bring everything to the Lord in prayer. So let me ask you this this morning. What are you currently complaining about that you need to carry to God in prayer instead? What are you currently complaining about that you need to carry to God instead? Now, it's really important here to know that this is not just a sermon about complaining. I mean, it is, and it is in there, but it's bigger. And if we don't see why it's bigger, then we will probably just try really hard this week to not complain. And you might get one week of joy, but you might go back to it. In fact, we will go back to it. Rather, we need to see the bigger picture of what God is doing on this side of the sea and what he's doing on this side of our salvation, having crossed over from death to life. What is the point of Mara? What is the point? Remember, God has actually led them there in the cloud, and so God led them to this bitter water of Mara for a purpose. What is the point? Well, we see the point in the second part of verse 25. Moses we kind of come out of the story and Moses inserts a comment. He inserts what's going on here behind this whole thing. And so he tells us the principle. There the Lord made for them a statue and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. What is the point of Mara? Well, God is testing his people. God is testing them. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up fearing tests. No one likes tests. Well, I didn't like tests. And I would find out there was a test coming up, and I always had a great amount of fear about that. I was nervous, worried, thinking that I was going to fail. And that's what I thought my teachers were giving me tests for, to actually make me fail. They wanted me to fail. In fact, I felt like they loved that red pen on my wrong answers. And they were gleefully doing that. They were loving every minute of it. And we could sometimes think that with God, too. We can think that God gives us tests because he wants us to fail. But none of my teachers wanted me to fail, even though I interpreted it that way. That's the way I thought, they, the reason they were giving me tests. They didn't want me to fail. They wanted me to learn. They wanted me to grow. They wanted me to change. And this is what God wants to do on this side of the sea. He tests you. This is so important for you to know this in the Christian life. God gives you tests. He gives you tests. You know, He accepted you in Jesus Christ. And that is final. That cannot be revoked. But now He tests your faith. And there will be a test that God has for you right now in your life where you are. He tests His people. And He's not hoping that you will fail the test He's ho hoping that you will learn and grow through the test and that you will trust him more on the other side of the test. This is what God does. And we see this actually explained for us in Exodus 20 when Moses gives the law, or God gives the law to Moses. Moses then comes to his people and he says, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that you may not sin that you may not, in the midst of trial, go down the destructive path of sin, which is no good for you, but instead in that trial you may trust God, which is good for you, that you will depend him on Him in the midst of that. And so God tests them not to, not, to, not, not to fail them, but to teach them that He is worthy of trust and obedience. You know, there's no such thing as untested faith. There's no such thing as untested faith. How do you know you have faith unless it has been tested? and come through on the other side. All the New Testament writers talk about this. First Peter, the tested genuineness of your faith, so that your faith may result in the praise and the glory and the honour of the Lord Jesus at His revelation. You see, God tests to gain our trust, but what we actually see here is that they flip it around and instead they test God. They test Him, and we do that too, don't we? We test God to see if he's good first, to see if we can trust him, and then we let him manage our life. It's like when you first get a job, before they make you permanent, what do they do? They give you a three-month probation. Why? To see if you can do the job. And this is what we do with God. 
we put him on probation to see if he could manage our lives, but we reserve the right to manage our life if we suspect that he's not doing a good job. We put God on probation. And there is this bitter place in our hearts that loves to do that, that loves self-reliance and self-trust rather than actually trusting in the living God. And that's what this test is about. God, the healer, he says, I'm the Lord, I'm your healer. He actually wants to heal that in us. He wants to take that lack of trust, that mistrust, and turn it into a deep dependence upon him. James 1, 2 verse 4, it spells that out because um, God, having brought us through on the other side of the sea and saved us and sanctified us, set us apart for him, he's actually now making us whole. He's recreating us bit by bit by bit. And James says this then, count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And steadfastness has its full effect, or let it have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete recreating, lacking in nothing. God is recreating us, causing us to test in Him, trust in Him through every trial that we go through. He is remaking us. Now, it's really important. There's two types of tests that God gives, or two, two kinds that I could think of, anyway. The first is this, the test of adversity, and that's what we see here. There's no water, and then there's bitter water, so the, the, the circumstances are bitter, And this is what happens in our life. God will allow these tests of adversity in our life. It could be the loss of income or the loss of a job or it could be a a time of of sickness or it could be some kind of thing that's happening in your family. It could be even just the mundane of life and having to get up every day and do the same thing again. Something going on at work, some kind of thing that's unjust. And all of these things are actually tests of adversity. And what God wants you to do in, in a test of adversity is trust him. Trust him in the midst of it. It's not, it's not like I'm going to manage my life until God proves that he can be trusted. It's like, no, I can't see yet what's going to happen, but I trust you, God. That's what a test of adversity is for. But then there's also another test, and this is the test of prosperity. This is when everything is going sweet, and you think to yourself, all right, uh, I can do it on my own now. I don't need God anymore. And so you start indulging a little bit and you think you can sin without consequence. And that's a really important test for us to learn because often we, comes out, we come out of tests of adversity and we come into a time of abundance or of prosperity and we start strutting. You know, we start getting a strut on and think, man, I can do this life on my own. But you know what that test is for? That is the test of your thankfulness. Whether you attribute everything that you have to God's hand or whether you think it's because of you and that you, you, you actually can be self-reliant now and all of that sort of stuff. So there's, there's two tests, the test of adversity, there's the test of prosperity and all of those things are God wanting you to deepen your trust in Him. He says here in this instruction, for I am the Lord your healer. He reveals more of His character And we've seen him in Exodus, in Exodus 3, we've we've seen him reveal his name. In Exodus 3, he said, I am who I am. He said, I am Yahweh, the personal God, the one who cares for Israel. And here, we get this kind of extension, this greater description of of his name. He is Yahweh Rofi in Hebrew, Yahweh Rofi. I am the Lord, your healer. And this is what he wants to do at this place of Mara, he wants to heal their lack of trust, the bitterness of their heart and transform it into a deep dependence on him so that when they come into trial, they aren't come to this place of doubting God and grumbling and murmuring and complaining, but they trust in him to provide everything that they need. And so we see this. We should leave today with a bit of a challenge about complaining and grumbling, but not only that, We should lead with a bigger picture that God always has tests for us and trials for us and they aren't his punishment of us. They are because he wants to bring us out of slavery and experience more of his freedom and let let steadfastness have its full effect because he's actually producing things in you. He's recreating you. But we shouldn't only leave with that. We should leave with even more. You see, there is a place that comes after Mara. And we see this in the text. After Mara 
comes a place called Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and there were 70 palm trees and they encamped there by the water. Sounds like a beautiful place, doesn't it? 12 springs, 70 palm trees, and the numbers are important because there are, of course, 12 tribes of Israel, so one spring for every tribe. There are also 70 elders over the people of Israel, charged with leading the people of Israel, and there are 70 palm trees. Now, this doesn't mean that just, you know, every elder gets a palm tree to himself. That's not, that's not the point. The point is, this is communicating God's complete and perfect and abundant care of his people. He is perfect in his care. And so we, you should actually leave this morning knowing not just a message about stop complaining, not just a message about what is God testing me on, but knowing with full assurance of God's complete and abundant care of you through all of your life. All of our life can be considered as wilderness. All of this life is going to have its bitter moments and it's going to have its moments of sweetness. But all throughout the whole thing, God cares for his people. After times of Mara and bitterness, God leads his people to a limb. He makes what is bittersweet. He provides abundantly for his people. You know, there's a number of hospitals and schools around the world that have adopted this name. The school of a limb or the ho- uh, a limb hospital. Why? Because they've picked up that this is the place that you come and you get healed by God. You get refreshed by God. Where he deals with your wounds and he provides abundant care for you. And this is what our God is like. He cares for us through all the ups and downs of our life. And this is an amazing thing. Charles Spurgeon writes on this particular text. He says, it is a wonder of mercy that the Lord puts up with us. You feel like that? I mean, this is amazing. All that happens in this story is there's no water, then the water's bitter, then they grumble and complain. And then God turns the bitter water sweet and leads them to a place of refreshment and abundant care. How good is God in the midst of our unfaithfulness? He always leads us to his place of refreshment after times of bitterness. You know, there's, you know, sorrow may tarry for the the evening, for the night, but joy comes in the morning. God delivers us, he binds us up, he remakes us, he restores us. And we need to see this amazing grace of God. God doesn't even rebuke them in this moment. You know, we see later in Exodus 33 that... uh, the full extent of God's character is, is revealed. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. It's like this full picture that's revealed to Moses on the mountain. But all the way through in these little mini stories, we're seeing that unfold. God doesn't even rebuke them in the midst of it. He's slow to anger. He wants to teach them. He wants to train them. He wants them to grow and depend on him and trust him more and more. God is so much more merciful and gracious than we give him credit for. He, he loves to care for his children, to provide for his children. You know, there's this example in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Ruth, of a woman named Naomi. And right at the beginning of the book of Ruth, uh, Naomi has these tragedies and these trials that happen in her life. She loses her husband and she loses her two sons. And that was a tragedy in itself to lose them, but it also put all of her future at risk because for a woman at that time to not be taken in and cared for meant that she was, her destiny looked totally stuffed. And she would, no provision for her, for her in any way in the future. And there's this beautiful picture because Ruth, she's like the perfect picture of a friend and a faithful friend who says to her mother-in-law, she says, I'll go with you wherever you go. I'll stay by your side. But Ruth can't receive it. Uh, Naomi can't receive it because she's so bitter of heart. And so Naomi says, comes into a place where she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And she's in such a place of grief that she's come to a place of resignation and and giving up. But then as you read through the amazing story of Ruth, which is all about God's providential care, that he actually orchestrates things all through 
all through Israel's history to care for them and provide for them. This amazing thing happens where there's this man of means, Boaz, who's like the most righteous and faithful man and he's a man who owns much and can provide and care for everyone. He actually takes notice or is, uh, Ruth is brought into his, um, his gaze and he ends up becoming her husband and takes Ruth as his wife. But not only does he redeem Ruth, but he also redeems Naomi. He takes in her mother-in-law. And so all of a sudden, what started out as this bitter place for her of tragedy and trial where she was just going to go off and resign her life to a life of hopelessness has now all of a sudden, through God's providential care, turned out for her blessing and her good. And right at the end of the story, Naomi is there and she's and she's, all the women come out of the city and they sing for joy and they actually recognize her blessing. And right there in the last paragraph of the story, she's standing there with the fruit of Ruth and Boaz's relationship with a little baby. And she's holding that blessing in her hand, just marveling at how things have turned for her, how God has made her bitter circumstances and made them sweet. And of course, that baby there is an ancestor of the Messiah who would come for the people of Israel. You see, God can be trusted all throughout Israel's history, even in their unfaithfulness and their grumbling. God is faithful. He provides. He cares in every way, and he did it in the most amazing and powerful way by providing Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world. And so Jesus actually said to to us, he said to his disciples, he said to, to, to everyone, Whoever's thirsty, come to me. Come to me and drink, and there will be a wellspring of life that leads to eternal life. Jesus is the one who ultimately satisfies. Jesus is the one who quenches our thirst. Jesus is the one who cares for us. And so we must come to him. We must bring every problem, every difficulty, every trial that we faced to him. Not with grumbling, but with faith. And so this is the the first lesson in the wilderness for us to learn. When life is bitter, bring your problem to God with faith, not with grumbling, because he has the power to make the bitter sweet. Secondly, his tests are designed to heal your bitterness of heart and to grow your trust in him. His his tests are specifically designed for that, not to harm you, but actually to heal the bitterness of your heart and make you grow and trust in him. So what is it that you need to trust in him about today? And then thirdly, after times of bitterness are over, he leads you to a place of abundance. I want to invite you just to bow your heads this morning to give you an opportunity just to reflect on a few things in your life this morning. The first thing is this. What are you currently complaining about? Feeling hard done by about that you need to carry to Jesus in prayer instead. Just the single prayer of faith. Secondly, how might God be testing you at the moment? If you're not sure, sometimes it's helpful to look, what is the main source of frustration in your life? The thing that always surfaces a dead end or surfaces frustration in your life and It's likely the place that God is testing you and wants to produce things in you that are actually going to set you free from them. Because bitterness of heart never feels good and it's not God's will or design for your life. He wants to free you from that. And so it's actually good to look at what is the source of frustration 
and then say, Lord, what are you teaching me in the midst of this? Teaching me humility. I need to humble myself. I've been very proud. Or perhaps it's, it's patience. I've been very impatient, very hasty. Perhaps it's for, for provision, trusting him for provision, whatever it is. What are you teaching me in this, this moment, in this place? Thirdly, what, what evidence do you have in your life that God is good and that you can trust Him? Just, just as we're about to head into singing, just recall some things in your mind. Well, Lord, you, you provided for me and you delivered me in this way in the past. I remember that so clearly. It was so powerful how you delivered me and worked in my life then. And now I'm in a different moment and I'm, I'm struggling to see and trust you again. But just recall all those things to mind about how God has done that. Ultimately, it's in Christ and the cross and his resurrection. That's where ultimately we look. But there are things in your life that God has done amazingly. He's provided in many ways. And it's actually looking at God's past faithfulness that will build your trust and your faith for now and the future. Just recall those things and worship him. Father God, we worship you and praise you. That you are a trustworthy God. Lord, I pray that we might be faithful to you as your people. That we might be willing to receive the things that you bring in our life, knowing that you're not punishing us, but Lord, you are wanting to grow and teach and change us. Lord, I pray, Lord, it's, it was easy for the people to sing at the water's edge of your victory. But Lord, at the first test, their, their worship and their singing turned to complaining. And I pray that, Lord, for us, that we would learn to sing, not just in the good times, but also in the trial. That we would sing in the valley as well and worship you because you are always good. And your care of your people is abundant and full and final. So, Lord, would you, right across this church family, Lord, would you grow our trust in you? Would you deepen our dependence upon you? And Lord, may we be filled with confidence that after times where life tastes bitter, you lead us to a place of abundance. We look forward to that day ultimately when it comes in glory, where we will experience eternal refreshment, where we will experience eternal joy at your side. And so Lord, we love you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, church. As we